going to get fired up here. Right. And we'll, uh, well, I'm going to get fired up. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully you won't catch on fire. Right, exactly. Maybe it's still fire. I'm going to pass it around the side. Yeah, it does like cold. And this was a talk that Ken just gave, so I kind of laughed at the last minute. Like last night. Like last night. Oh, really? I don't know. Rick calls me and says, hey, can you give that presentation you gave last week tomorrow night? I'm like, well, yes. <laughs> fresh in his mind. And so, yeah, it's fresh in my mind, yeah. so that's good. No, no, where did you give the talk uh, before this? I gave it at the uh, Summit County Aries. Okay. Services okay. Uh, I guess we'll get started. Uh, my name is Ken Dorsey. I'm K-A-H-O-A-D, in case you don't know me. Uh, I gave a talk here once before about uh, software-defined radios, so you might uh, recognize me from that. Yes, sir. No, no, I'm sorry. Oh, I to get her. <laughs> I thought, there can't be a question already. Eventually. So tonight we're gonna. I'm gonna uh, talk about uh, the broadband ham net or the HSMM mesh, what is what it used to be called. Now they've changed the name to broadband ham net. Um, it's a mesh node type system that a lot of the amateur radio operators are starting to use now for emergency communications. And if you were at the meeting last Thursday night, I apologize, this is going to be the exact same <laughs> talk. So uh, I apologize in advance for that. Um, I am going to kind of put a amateur radio spin on it. So if you're not an amateur radio operator, you may get a little bored here and there. But uh, it does, I mean, everything we're going to talk about tonight as far as mesh networks and all that stuff, works exactly the same in the non-ham world as it does in the ham world. It's only that the, us ham radio operator guys are lucky because we are in the, the, the um, routers, part of the frequency spectrum, the spectrum that the routers exist in also is part of the ham radio spectrum that we're allowed to use with higher power, uh, with you know, uh, gain antennas, amplifiers, things like that that you couldn't use if you were just using it as a, as a regular product, as just a consumer product device. So, so that's where you know, the ham radio guys are really starting to get very involved in this because this is a great system, especially for setting up emergency type um, networking. And we'll, sh and we'll kind of get into that a little bit. Uh, what I'd like to do first, I want to play a short audio presentation. Uh, this is from a, uh, the, the group in the Austin, Texas ham radio group. Most of this hand mesh stuff started in Austin. So Austin's way far advanced than a lot of other places. They've got a mesh set up. And the entire uh, city of Austin is completely covered by a mesh network now. And, uh, so they're, uh, they're really into it. But this is sort of like a commercial for their group. So I apologize again, it's going to be ham radio related, but it does talk about a little bit about the mesh. It's about a five minute long uh, of audio presentation, so I'm going to hit, get that started. This is Craig, a C5KW, and this is TC Aries training. This training was written by Mark, W5MAE, and Jim, K5KTF. High-speed multimedia mesh networks offer growing capabilities for communications in an emergency response. They are becoming a basic tool for ARIES communicators. Mesh networks are formed by using a popular family of Linksys home wireless routers. The router firmware is replaced with free amateur radio firmware to specialize them for this use. The older model routers are out of production, but they're still readily available for about $35. The WRT54GL is still in production and can be found new online for around $50. The new firmware uses the router's hardware to create an amateur radio network that is entirely separate from its original home networking application. The new network automatically links only other HSMM mesh nodes to an internet protocol network providing a high-speed link between each node and automatic routing of data through the network. The mesh nodes automatically join the mesh when they are powered on or come within range of another and can leave the mesh at any time. The mesh network transparently manages the networking details. Redundancy and linkages between the nodes maintains the network even when nodes leave. 
Numerous mesh nodes can be deployed across a city to provide a city-wide network. Stationary nodes can be deployed at hospitals, EOCs, and favorable spots for good radio coverage. Mobile mesh nodes can be deployed at an incident site or operated while moving. The standard node link range is limited to a couple of thousand feet, but it can be improved under Part 97 with inexpensive higher gain antennas and bi-directional amplifiers to dramatically extend the distance over which nodes can be linked. Reliable link distances of 10 miles have been achieved. Using longer link distances, multiple intermediate nodes, virtual private network tunnels, and internet gateways, a mesh node network can be extended to any location on Earth. Local VHF wind link systems have ranges of up to 50 miles and can be extended using digipeters, but their data rates are typically 150 characters per second. HF wind link systems have ranges of hundreds or thousands of miles but their data rates are under 300 characters per second. Other HF digital modes, such as PSK31, have ranges of thousands of miles, but their data rates are very low, typically around 10 characters per second. Mesh networks can be deployed to cover a city or an even larger area, and their data rates are typically 1 million characters per second or more. Local amateurs have been working to extend the coverage of the Austin Mesh Network. It has now reached a critical point where it will provide significant capabilities in a local emergency. Mesh nodes are now installed and working at SeaTech, the American Red Cross headquarters, some area hospitals, and many other sites. Local amateurs are specifically working to add mesh node upgrades to all Arches installations. Extensive mesh networks are already in place in Houston and Las Vegas. Many cities in Florida, Georgia, Oregon, Silicon Valley, and elsewhere are actively building networks. So why is this important? Digital modes carry a larger and growing share of emergency communications. Our served agencies prefer to use email and exchange file formatted data. They have need of other advanced capabilities that our traditional digital modes do not support well. Because mesh networks are fast internet protocol networks, applications that are typically found on the internet and local area networks, or LANs, can be supported on mesh networks. Connect a computer to a mesh node, and it can transfer files at high speed to another computer connected to a mesh node on the other side of the city. Doctors can share medical images and diagnoses between hospitals, improving emergency health care. Connect an IP camera at an incident site and the video can be viewed at the CTEC. Connect a video conferencing system and a Red Cross shelter can communicate directly with headquarters or another shelter. Connect a PBX system and the network will support VOIP phones. Connect a web server and web pages or a wiki or EOC management software can provide information and information sharing between the incident site and the EOC. Mesh networks are intended to provide communications during an emergency where commercial communications have been lost over a large area. In some emergencies, the mesh network may extend to a location with a working internet connection. A mesh node can be used to gateway the mesh network to the commercial internet then local emergency management personnel can communicate directly with state and federal agencies. Mesh networks have a lot of potential, and we need your help to develop your capabilities to deploy and use them. To learn more, visit hsmm-mesh.org or attend the Digital Wednesday meeting at the Austin Red Cross headquarters on the fourth Wednesday of every month at 7 p.m. Emergency Operations Center.
on the same channel, huh? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, well, anyway, <laughs> I can do this manually. So, again, broadband ham mat, formerly HSMM high speed multimedia mesh. And what is it exactly? You kind of got a little overview of what it was with that uh, commercial there. But uh, basically, it's a high speed, self discovering, fault tolerant, self configuring ham network slash wireless computer network. They can run for days from a fully charged car battery or indefinitely with the additional amount of solar array or other supplemental power source. Its primary focus, again, is on emergency communications. Uh, it's currently unique being designed, developed, and deployed as an amateur radio broadcan broadcast broadband communication system. And it originated, again, like I said, in Austin, but it's spread all over the U.S. as they talked about. You know, there's nodes in Houston and nodes in Las Vegas. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of other countries also jumping on this, you know, broadband hamnet bandwagon. Uh, in its current form, it uses uh, just a standard Linksys router. Uh, WRT54G, GL, or GS routers will work, uh, and they operate. It operates on channels one through six of the 2.4 gig uh, band, which overlaps the upper portion of 13, 13 centimeter amateur radio band. So basically, it's time you know, for hands to have their own broadband network. We've been transferring data by radio for a long time, but you know, nothing like this. This, this is a fast network. You know, you're looking at 54 megabits per second compared to what we used to do at, uh, in packet days of 1.2 or 9.6 kilobits per second. So big advantage there is the speed. <coughs> So this is kind of a diagram of the, the band, and, and it shows the overlap between the, uh, the ham band, the part 97, 13 centimeter band, and then the regular ISM commercial part 15 um, consumer band. So there's a, an overlap from 2.4 gigahertz to 2.45 gigahertz. So, I said that you know we, we can run channels one through six, and this kind of describes why we can't go past channel six, because channel seven, the high frequency is at 2.53 gigs, so that's actually outside of our 2.40 gigahertz range. So we can't go beyond channel six, but we can use any one of channels one through six. Um, so far, channel one is the channel of preferred channel that most people are using. So generally, if you're going to be on a, a, a network, a, a broadband ham net network, you're probably going to be on channel one. I don't know of anybody using any other channels other than one at this time. So some basic concepts about it. It's a network. It's not application software, obviously. <coughs> It does have special firmware that transforms your standard consumer wireless gear into a specialized ham radio function. Uh, it can use application software to transport the data from place to place, but you still have to provide that software just like you would at, you know, at your home or your office. Um, it, is a mesh, it is a highway over which data travels. Turning on two mesh nodes loaded with the broadband ham net firmware creates a network. This highway will carry your data and allow your local computer to use information or applications stored in other locations. Bless you. Thank you. Uh, mesh nodes were, are originally, again, consumer wireless routers, but by updating the internal software, the firmware, and the router, the function of the device is changed. They're um, a data network basically without the wires. Most tasks that you can do over a wired or wireless network in your home or office will work on a mesh node. Mesh nodes are small, portable, again, low power, and they're inexpensive. Um, he mentioned you can get them, you know, as cheap as um, thirty dollars, thirty thirty-five dollars on eBay. But I know a couple guys, <laughs> like Frank. What did you get yours for? I think I got one for seven and five or seven dollars and a couple bucks shipping. Yeah, on Without eBay. Power supply. Yeah. All right. So I mean, they're they're out there. I, I know one of the guys in our group. He uh, got one on eBay, and it cost him more to ship it than it cost him to buy the thing. So. He had to ship it from Arizona. It was like seven dollars to ship it. I think he paid four dollars for the, <laughs> the router. So, um, so they they are available cheaply now. I have a couple of GLs 
The GLs are still in production and they're available. You can buy them at, on Amazon anytime you want for uh, $49. So they're in production still and they're available out there. There's no problem. Um, However, I have a feeling as more and more people jump into this mesh thing, they're probably going to get to dry up, the dry up pretty fast. Yeah. Well, that's like that little IP camera. Um, I have an IP camera there that is it retails on Amazon for $149, but the price fluctuates by $100, it seems like, almost every week. And it got down to $49, so I jumped on one at $49. And then, uh, I put out a message on one of the ham net, on one of the mesh bulletin boards that, uh, or one of the mesh uh, news groups that um, the camera was out there for $49. I think two people bought it and then the, the very next day or something like that, it went back up to like $89. So they, they realized that they were selling them too cheaply apparently. But you can, if you watch for them, you can probably get them there. Right? They're selling, I just checked today, they're selling today for $59. So. Prices come down again a little bit, so until somebody buys one again, then they'll probably jack the price down. Um, but anyway, um, they they are easily battery powered, and you'll see tonight we have a, a couple of systems in here that are battery powered. This one behind me here is battery powered, um, and that makes it nice for emergency communications. You know, that's the perfect thing that we want for an emergency communications device. We want something that we can park out there somewhere. Uh, where we need it and, you know, just run it off of battery or run it off of solar or, or something like that. Um, they can have a range of 10 miles or more using stock power and gain antennas if you have true line of sight. Uh, true line of sight is very important, <laughs> as, Frank <found. laughs> as Frank and Grover found out this week when they tried some testing. Uh, yeah, any, any, you know, any, it's obviously, it's microwave, so anything that has moisture is going to wipe that signal. So, you know, tree leaves, anything like that, trees, um, you're going to definitely uh, degrade your signal if you're going through stuff like that. In fact, I've even heard that real, real heavy rain can have an effect. Well, just, I don't know how many people have had like dish network or whatever, but even in like a heavy rain, your dish network goes out too. So, but, um, the, so rain and, and moisture does affect them. Um, they only connect to other mesh nodes. So once you've put the firmware in this for a mesh node, it's only going to be able to connect to other mesh nodes. But it also means that they can connect to all the nodes that they can directly reach. And again, like I said, they operate on channel one primarily. Uh, channel one through six are available. Um, they uh, they talk to other nodes using the Wi-Fi connection, and then they talk to the internet over the WAN port. So the the uh, routers will have a WAN port on them, and you can use the WAN port to actually connect to like a you know a, 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 a old cable modem or something like that if you want to have an internet connection to them. And then uh, your, your uh, computers and servers and video cameras and all your other devices, of course, you use the LAN ports just like a, on a regular, uh, you know, uh, wired system. And they just, they, they create a network just by turning some of them on. They create portable high-speed data networks in minutes. There's no fussing with them. There's no, you know, I've got to know what the IP address is. I have to configure it for the IP address. All that stuff that you do on your normal home router that you have to do to get it to your laptop to talk to your normal home router, you don't do with a mesh network. You turn it on, and it comes up on the network. It finds the network and just look, links to anything out there it can find. Um, they don't need a computer to be attached to pass data. You just plug it in and it expands the mesh. Um, you don't need to physically attach to a node to make changes to it, and I'll show that a little bit later on. You can actually, over the net, over the mesh, you can connect to another node and actually make changes to that node via the mesh. You don't even have to be physically connected to a node to be able to change the node. So that's something else you can do. Um, and again, you know, data is data. It can be IP video, voice over IP, LAN traffic, uh, web browsers, reading of situations, briefing page. Uh, you can download software by FTP, print something on a remote printer. You know, anything you can do on a regular wired network or wireless network, you can do on a mesh network. Okay. Um, 
Um, IP addresses do exist in the mesh, but we don't use them. We only connect to other nodes via its node name. And that's one thing you have to set up in the configuration. When you go to configure these, there are basically a couple things. You have to set up a node name, and if you're using it as a ham, then you have to put your call sign into that node name. And then you also have to set up the um, the um, uh, yeah, you. the SID. Yeah, thank you, the SID. You have to set up the SID. Yeah, you have to set up the SID too. Because you have to have the same SID or obviously you're not gonna talk to anybody else on the on the network. So it's the SID common across the entire network? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. The SID so that they were, uh, originally they were using HSMM dash mesh and they've changed that now and now they're requesting everybody uses broadband hamnet dash V1. And that's a capital B and capital H in the broadband hamnet. So so they've changed that uh, that SSID. And you know the names can be a tactical call. You still have to put in your hand call, but then you can put in uh, a tactical call after that. You can put in a, a slash and a tactical call, or a dash and a tactical. Uh, you know, you can say like uh, K A eight O A D. Mine, mine comes up and says dash one because that's this is my first node here, and then I've got dash two and dash three, and so you know. But you could, I could call it K A eight O A D dash E O C or K A eight O A D dash Red Cross or K A eight O A D dash um, you know whatever. It's, it's, it's just you can put anything after your call as long as you have your call. Um, Again, any mesh node within range will automatically join the mesh and exchange all available routes with all others. If one mesh node has internet access or contains a network time protocol server, all the mesh nodes will get a correct date and time in their display. Uh, as signals grow stronger and fade, the nodes are going to join and leave the mesh. And it can happen if you're driving around, it can happen a lot. You know, obviously, if you're driving around, your path is between any two mesh nodes, maybe a single hop or a multiple hop, and they can and will change with no notice or impact to you. And that's when a mesh, when your node changes, that's completely uh, transparent to the end user. You don't see that happen. There's no, there's, well, I can't say there's no delay because I don't know that. But I've tried with the testing that I've done at home, I don't even see any perceivable delay when I drop one, a mesh node out and put it back in or something. You don't even see that happen. So um, there may be some slight delay, but it's not noticeable. Uh, and the data flows where it needs to flow because of the automatic routing delivered by OLSR, which is the optimized link state routing protocol. And that's how they use that. Actually, how they set up the mesh is through the optimized link state routing. Yeah. Um, a single node joining your mesh main may add other nodes if it can see other nodes that the first group can't reach. It actually becomes a bridge and bridges those two groups of nodes. So let's say we had a, a bunch of nodes in southern Summit County and a bunch of nodes in northern Summit County, but they couldn't see each other. If we dropped a node somewhere in the center of Summit County that could see both the southern half and the northern half, all of those meshes would be joined. We would join that mesh completely from the north to the south. 